Well, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I mean, it's one person. Uh, first, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am coming to you from the University of Alaska Fairbanks Trathkada campus, which is located in the traditional homelands of the Lower Tannin and Diné people. I acknowledge the past, present, and future stewardship and place based knowledge of the people of these territories. Um, with that, a couple of logistics before we get started. Um, we're going to do a little walkthrough of the Zoom interface here. Um, first, a couple tips. Uh, if you have Zoom is pretty bandwidth intensive, so if you're having any bandwidth issues, it'll probably manifest itself as an audio problem where you'll be losing your audio connection. Um, everyone has been set to mute right now, and during the question and answer session, I will allow you to unmute yourself. Um, also, everyone but the presenters have their videos turned off. Um, and a couple of suggestions for if you are having bandwidth issues. Um, first of all, if your audio is cutting in and out, you can always connect your phone instead of using your computer audio. Um, also, try shutting down other programs, email, web browsers, all of that jazz, because that is eating up your bandwidth as well. And also, if you're on a VPN, oftentimes that will cause issues as well. So try connecting not on a VPN. Uh, a quick tour of the Zoom interface. Right there is the mute and unmute button. As I said, everyone is muted right now, but during the question and answer time, you will be able to um, unmute yourself. Right there, you can also unmute yourself in the participant window. Um, the little arrow that's right next to the mute button, if you click on that, it will give you a drop down menu that allows you to switch audio. So if you do need to switch to phone audio, you can click on that and that will allow you to switch. Um, and this, you'll get a pop-up that gives you a phone number and meeting ID and stuff like that to call in. And also, um, your video is turned off, but if you want to see who's part of this meeting, you can click on the participant menu at the bottom, and it'll pop up on the side, and so then you can see everybody. Um, everyone has the chat function enabled, so if you can click on the little chat icon that's at the bottom, it will pop up another little menu on the side and then you can send chat messages to the group everyone and then um, finally if you need to leave for any reason there is also this leave button right there let me admit this last person and i'm going to stop sharing my screen here so with all of that i would um i would like to welcome all of our speakers we have a whole collection for you we have jill pruitt who is the regional ocean data sharing coordinator for the alaska ocean observing system rick toman who is the alaska climate specialist for acap at the international arctic research center here at uaf katie howard who is a fishery scientist with the alaska department of fish and game and Yvette sidden who is a fisheries research biologist for the alaska fisheries science center let me get these last few people in. And then also I want to remind everyone that this entire thing is being recorded and the slides and the recording will all go on the webinar page. So I think with that, Jill is up first. So Jill, if you wanted to start sharing your screen, um, take it away from here. Okay, let me get this ready to go. Let me just confirm that you're seeing just my slides? Yep, looks perfect. Great, thank you, Tina, so much. And thanks to the other speakers. And um, I just wanted to give a, a quick overview of the Bering Science publication before we um, get to the more interesting speakers of the day, but just to give you a little background on what this publication is about. Um, Oops, let's see if it'll let me advance. There we go. So this publication is part of a larger project, the Bering Region Ocean Data Sharing Initiative. And this was national funding to the regional ocean observing systems to support data and information sharing. And one way that AU's decided to put some of this funding is towards this outreach publication that we've been working on with uh, UAF's International Arctic Research Center. And specifically, I wanna call out Heather McFarland for the wonderful work that she's done for us. And so our overall objective for this report, uh, this publication is to be a resource for uh, state, federal, community, and university partners to share their recent research and observations with community members, other scientists, management agencies, and anybody who's interested in the ecosystem of the Bering region. 
And we have a pretty broad definition of, of the Bering region in and around the Bering Sea. Uh, we're talking about through the Aleutians up through the southern Chukchi. So uh, what do we put in there? How do we put, how do we decide what goes in there? We have a community advisory panel that we stood up last fall. This is a, a six member panel, panel that represents communities from the Aleutians through the Pribilofs and Western Alaska. And these members advise us on what type of content their communities would like to see, the format that they would like to see it in, they help us review the publication before it goes out, and they also help us facilitate feedback from the communities once it's gone out. So we get our information from a lot of different sources. We get this from public reports, such as the ecosystem status reports that Yvette will talk about a little bit more. Um, we also reach out to state, federal agencies, tribal entities academics and communities and ask them if they have recent research results that they want to share with us and share in the Bering Science Report. And we also use feedback from the previous reports to guide us on what type of content people want to see in the next report. So quick example, um, in the first report, we didn't have any information about crab. And we had a couple of people that pointed out that this were, these were really important to include. So we made a concerted effort to gather information and put it in future reports. So what ended up going into this most recent report, uh, everything from climate, uh, information about erosion and the fall storms. Sorry, I live near uh, Lake Hood and you'll hear small planes. <laughs> um, so up through marine mammals, marine debris, and specifically, we included a contact person for each of these topics. And we, we wanted to do this so that the readers could go to that person if they had questions or wanted more information. They could look through this list of more than 30 contacts that have links to published papers, reports, and also um, people that they could contact for the community observations as well and um, be able to get more information. So this publication is mailed to box holders from Shishmaref to Unalaska. We also mailed it to school districts and tribal offices, and we posted it electronically on the AUS and IARC websites and social media. And we're really interested in getting feedback. So we included on the mailed copies a prepaid postcard, and we also set up a survey monkey to ask um, people's opinions on the report. And so far from the uh, 20 report, or postcards that we've received back, we've, we're finding that people found it relevant. Um, we also found that we think we hit the mark with uh, the level of detail that we included with most people saying that it was just right. But we also had some specific uh, comments that we'll, we'll use to help guide us on the next report. First of all, people wanted to, uh, to continue to send these reports out. They also wanna learn about changes elsewhere in Alaska. People asked follow-up questions about specific topics. So we'll be working with experts to try to get answers to those questions um, back to those people. People also wanna see more contributions from, from local people. And we'll be working specifically with our community advisory panel to uh, figure out how we can include more information from local people in the next report. People also mentioned new topics that they want included, for example, walrus. Um, so we'll make a concerted effort to continue to try to get walrus information in the report. And I included a, a couple of quotes from the, um, the postcards. People planning on giving it to high school teachers. Um, they want more information about changes over the decades. And also um, highlighting that this is important for all coastal Western Alaskans. Um, since they depend on uh, these resources, but they also want more information on eiders and seabirds that are affected. So the future, uh, we're always looking for content for the next publication. So if you have a research project or observations that you want highlighted in the, the next Bearing Science publication, if you know of a project that we should include, definitely send me an email. And if possible, if you have a contact uh, person for that project, then I can reach out to them and ask them if they're interested in having their information in the next Bearing Science publication. So my email is there and um, I will now pass it off to the more interesting speakers of the day. So thanks.
Great, thanks, Jill. And I think uh, Rick is next. So if you want to go ahead, Rick, and share your screen, go for it. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you see the uh, title slide there? Yes, it's perfect, Rick. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. And um, thanks for taking time out of your day to uh, join in here. And so I am going to do the, um, the weather and climate part of today's presentation. So basically we'll be taking a look at, um, I have it titled here, a uh, winter 2021, really um, through, the, through the cold season here, uh, starting last, uh, last fall. So um, take a look at temperatures and precipitation and the season snowfall. Um, we'll be hearing more about what's going on in, in the Bering Sea itself, uh, but I'll touch on just ocean surface temperatures here. So the, um, the maybe the most proximate climate part of the oceans, but we'll be hearing more. And then, um, and then finish up uh, with uh, some info on sea ice uh, during the past season. So uh, casting your minds back to autumn of 2020, um, temp these are departures of, from average for temperatures on the left and per precipitation as a percentage of normal on the right. And I'm using the, the ERA-5 reanalysis here. So this um, does, in some cases, differ a little bit from the station-based data, although they're generally in the same ballpark. So for the autumn as a whole, September through November, temperatures on the left-hand side there, you can see the entire Bering Sea region was warmer than normal. That's the, the warm colors there with the strongest uh, or the largest departures from normal in the north and a pretty steady uh, a south to north uh, increase in the departures from normal. And that is in part tied to the, um, to the lack of sea ice um, as uh, since for all of these graphics, just for consistency's sake, I'm using the 1981 to 2010 uh, baseline for average. Uh, you may be aware that NOAA recently, uh, last month, upgraded to 1991 to 2020. But for this purpose, we'll just stick with the, the uh, 81 to 2010 baseline. Precipitation on the right-hand side, um, most, but not all of the Bering Sea had above normal precipitation, kind of a bullseye, 150% uh, uh, or one and a half times the normal precipitation there centered on Nome. Uh, the main area that was uh, significantly drier than normal, uh, parts of the Aleutians um, uh, and a large fraction of the area was not too different uh, from normal. So that's just kind of the, the gross uh, large scale climate variables. Moving into winter now, so December, January, February, uh, quite a different pattern now with temperatures on the left hand side. You can see, except for portions of the Seward Peninsula, Eastern Norton Sound, Bering Sea region warmer than normal, but now we see that the warmest area relative to normal, kind of in the, uh, the South Central Bering Sea, Pribilof Islands over towards Bristol Bay. That's where, that's where uh, temperatures were farthest above normal, as we'll see didn't have much in the, or any in the way of sea ice in that part of the world. Uh, in the north, uh, if we broke this down by months, which I didn't just in the interest of time here, we would see December was, and to a lesser extent, January above normal, February uh, cooler. Precipitation on the right-hand side, now uh, quite, uh, quite significant differences across the Northern Bering Sea, uh, Southern Chukchi Sea, below normal precipitation for the midwinter period here. And um, Kotzebue, Nome areas, both actually significantly less uh, precipitation than average for the midwinter period. In contrast, Southern Central Bering Sea, as well as St. Lawrence Island and the YK Delta into Bristol Bay, above normal precipitation, but especially uh, from the Pribilofs up towards, uh, up to really uh, St. Lawrence Island, significantly more precipitation in the midwinter period than the 1981 to 2020 average. Now moving into spring, uh, once again, a little bit different pattern for temperatures on the left, but again, you see 
that the South Central Bering Sea pribble offs north towards St. Matthew Island, significantly warmer than normal for the three month period. Again, a lot of that um, uh, sea ice driven. Uh, in the north, more of a mixed bag, but for the three months as a whole, departures were not very large in the, in the northern Bering, southern Chukchi region, as well as uh, on the mainland uh, Bristol Bay area, uh, even a little bit below normal in the upper Bristol Bay. But uh, so all three seasons for the three month periods, certainly different characteristics for temperatures overall. Precipitation on the right hand side, now we see uh, above normal precipitation over most of the Bering Sea, except for uh, the central Aleutians, which were significantly drier than normal in this product. And again, uh, St. Lawrence Island area and now the Seward Peninsula uh, significantly wetter than normal. And if again, if we broke it down by months, we'd see March was exceptionally wet. Um, May was overall fairly dry across Western Alaska. So for the season, kind of pulled that down. But the overall spring wet, except for the central Aleutians. All right. So um, another product we can get out of the era five uh, reanalysis. Um, here is the percentage of, um, if you will, the snowpack. So this is the water equivalent in the snowpack as a percentage of the 1981 to 2000. 10 median, blue colors indicate more uh, water in the snowpack than uh, was typical in that 30 year period. And you can see that above normal snowpack uh, for the average for March, so the end of the accumulation period, near the end of the accumulation period, above normal, most of the Bering Sea coastal regions, the exceptions, the central Aleutians and uh, the Pribilofs with, um, with less uh, snowpack than normal, but all in all, um, a pretty healthy uh, snow year across uh, the Bering Sea uh, coastal region. Now, storminess, I don't have a great way to quantify storminess yet uh, for you that we are working on that, but um, at the moment, uh, what we have, um, uh, just our narrative here. So early November was a very stormy time. Uh, we did have a significant impacts in the Northern Bering Sea. That picture from our last uh, uh, publication uh, that Jill showed there, um, coastal flooding, a uh, road wash out there at Shishmarep. Here's a beach erosion east of town, known uh, in, um, in the, one of the early November uh, storms. That subsided as we went through uh, November and into the winter period when the storminess was mostly confined to the Southern Bering Sea. And that was uh, to some extent reflected in that below normal precipitation uh, in parts of the Northern Bering Sea. But some of those weather fronts did get up uh, to uh, St. Lawrence Island. And so uh, somewhat more stormy uh, out there. Big pattern change in March, of course, uh, with, uh, with the winds turning more southerly to southwesterly across the Bering Sea. And so some decrease in storminess in the Southern Bering Sea, although not a lot, but the big change in the Northern Bering Sea where frequent storms, Nome having six blizzards or near blizzards uh, between March 6th and, um, and uh, April 10th. So really quite a stormy period. And this is the third spring in a row with really dramatic storminess in the Northern Bering Sea uh, during the early spring season. Ocean temperatures around, um, around the Bering Sea, Southern Chukchi. Here, we'll, uh, here we start in the October through December period. You can see nearly all of uh, the region with uh, above normal temperatures. Parts of the central Southern Bering Sea were close to normal within a half degree Celsius of normal, but overall uh, warmth uh, hanging on from the summer of 2020. Uh, across of the region. A few areas there you can see like uh, Cuscoquim Bay, Bristol Bay, um, indicated in this product with slightly below normal temperatures um, for the, the late autumn season here. Um, some of this is due to a change in the database I'm using for this, where they changed the way temperatures are handled in the presence of sea ice. So I wouldn't make too much of, um, of those below normal areas, certainly in, out in the open ocean warmer than normal dominated 
uh, for the early or for the late autumn season. Different story uh, for the late winter season here, January through March with um, now you can see uh, with the presence of sea ice, uh, but not entirely due to sea ice there, uh, generally below normal for the three months, January through March across the Northern Bering Sea. But notice that belt of above normal uh, sea surface temperatures extending from outer Bristol Bay, kind of west to northwestward, uh, past the Aleutians out across the deep water of the central and western Bering Sea. And that was a very persistent pattern. We saw this basically for most of 2021 until about the last month or so when this is broken down. But during the cold season, that belt of, of above normal ocean temperatures there across the central and southern Bering Sea persisted uh, quite, uh, quite amazingly. All right, sea ice. So um, here I just grabbed the National Weather Service uh, Alaska Region Sea Ice Program concentration analysis on the first of the months. And um, just to give you the quick overview here. And so uh, starting in November 1st, we had hardly any ice um, in the Bering or Southern Chukchi Sea. Uh, by the time we uh, go through November, we do have ice growing out from uh, the coast, but still uh, it's pretty low, and uh, we'll quantify that in a moment. Um, going uh, through December and into the new year, then we did see uh, expansion of the sea ice to the point uh, by the time we got to early February to February first, there when we have ice from Bristol Bay northwest to um, to St. Uh, Matthew Island, and then over uh, continuing northwest to uh, the Russian coast. Um, so this is not a typical. Uh, for what we've seen in recent years, um, of course, very different than uh, the historical uh, expectations. Late season ice, uh, really quite interesting. You'll notice um, March 1st, April 1st, May 1st there, that um, the southern ice edge actually doesn't change very much. And that was really one of the features of the uh, ice, sea ice in the Bering Sea this past winter is we got ice to about or a little past uh, uh, St. Matthew Island over towards Bristol Bay, but um, really did not make much progress south of there. On the other hand, unlike say 2020, uh, we did not see a big uh, loss of area of ice coverage uh, during the spring, during that stormy time. And um, uh, the last slide I have may be a possible explanation why that was the case. Um, as we move through May, of course, and into um, through the month of May, then, of course, the uh, expected seasonal uh, sea ice loss, um, although ice has hung on, um, again, not historically unusually, but at least compared to some recent years, uh, fairly late in the northern Bering Sea, although at the, as of now, uh, January, June 22nd, um, almost the only remaining ice is a little bit yet around. Uh, St. Lawrence Island and um, still some decaying shore fast ice over on the uh, western uh, Gulf of Anadir coast. So um, here's the here's the time series uh, showing this shows the start of the uh, of the 2021 ice season and here I'm using not the the low resolution passive microwave uh, from the National Snow and Ice Data Center data set that uh, we use for the longer term trends. But this is from a product that is utilizing that, uh, that multi-sensor uh, human machine interface uh, for sea ice analysis. And this is much better with low sea ice amounts. And the blue line is 2020. This particular database goes back to 2006. And you can see there for November, we were at or close to the lowest in that 15-year uh, record. Uh, did see ice start to pick up, especially relative to the lowest years uh, during December, but it was really only in January that um, the ice started to pick up, but very slow start, even compared to the very warm, uh, warm years um, that we've had recently. Now here's the, here's the long, uh, the, the full season time series here. The blue line is this year for reference, the green year is last uh, winter, and you can see, Relative to that thick black line, which is just the long-term 
of the 30 year average, we stayed below the long term average the entire season. But notice uh, that while we did see some decrease in the sea ice extent um, after March 1st this year, the blue line, the dip is not nearly as great as we saw in the stormy period in March of 2020. And in fact, you can see that re that relatively slow decline in the sea ice uh, starting in April this year. And um, uh, of course, ice about now gone. But um, it's really quite a quite an interesting season. You can see there's there's ups and downs, but from February first really till mid uh, April, there's the ice uh, amount, the sea ice extent, um, two dimensional amount, um, was comparatively stable, especially compared to last year. How did the uh, maximum sea ice extent uh, in the Bering Sea play out? Well, um, it was actually pretty low. It's actually the um, the eighth lowest daily maximum in that uh, in the forty two year record there. And you can I uh, plotted all the maximums there on the left hand side for you, plus the daily trace for a while there in twenty twenty one, just so you can see that. Um, again, not as low as two thousand eighteen or nineteen, but uh, for instance, lower than last year. And on the right-hand side, this is what the, uh, the uh, Weather Service uh, Sea Ice Program analyzed as the uh, uh, concentration there on, uh, on March 4th, the date of the maximum extent. And you can see, again, that very stable ice edge did not come anywhere close to the Pribilofs um, this past winter. And my final slide here. So why did not why didn't we see uh, that uh, the big drop when the stormy weather kicked in in, in March? And uh, this is a a product using satellite based estimate of sea ice thickness uh, using a couple of different uh, products here. This is courtesy of the uh, Alfred Wegener Institute uh, in Germany, and uh, I plotted here up just the satellite estimated thickness. Um, this is in inches here and then annotated it for you. And what I want to point out here is that not very far north of the ice edge, we have relatively thick ice. This is much thicker ice than we saw last year from this product. And so you can see there's, there's uh, 48 inches, four feet of, of thick ice there, um, not very far northwest of uh, St. Matthew Island and greater than two foot thickness band there extending from the Russian coast all the way uh, to uh, almost a Hooper Bay there. So I think this much thicker ice, as we all know, thicker ice, more resilient in the face of storminess. And that's very different than we had in two, 2020 when the ice extent was farther south, but that ice was very thin. So that when the stormy weather kicked in in March, it just got chewed up by the warm temperatures and especially, of course, the, uh, the uh, effects of the water and the waves. So, and I think this has contributed to the, the longer lasting ice that we have this year. So that's what I have for you. And I believe I turn it over to Katie. You might still be muted, Katie. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. There you go. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be giving a brief uh, update on the status of salmon in the Bering, Eastern Bering Sea. So really, that's including Bristol Bay, Kuskokwim, Yukon, Norton Sound salmon. And I just wanna mention right off the top that everything I'm sharing with you today is, is really a team effort. So I, I just wanna mention Sabrina Garcia at Alaska Department of Fish and Game, who's um, uh, really instrumental in, in some of the marine surveys we do in the Bering Sea, as well as Jim Murphy at Alaska Fishery Science Center at NOAA. Um, he's, he's been very instrumental with a lot of this research. So. Um, I'm going to start off with a really brief um, recap on what 2020 was like, what our expectations for 2021 are, some of the research we've been doing, and, and a few key takeaways from the years of research in the Bering Sea. Oops. 
Okay, so this first figure is showing what 2020 rent abundances were like relative to the past 20 year average. And so this thick black line uh, across the middle is average. Any of the bars below that line are below average. Bars above that line are above the average. The taller the bar in either direction, the more different from average. And so what we saw in 2020, there were a couple bright spots. Sockeye salmon, primarily from Bristol Bay, were above average. Pink salmon were above average. We've seen a lot of pink salmon in Norton Sound in recent years. But the other salmon species were, were not faring as well. Chinook salmon have been uh, below average for quite some time, a number of years now. Chum salmon um, were very poor, not just in Western Alaska, but also throughout their North Pacific distribution in 2020. And so that was a little bit of a surprise for a lot of people. And then coho salmon also tended to be below average uh, in this area. So for 2021, there are only a few stocks where we have um, some forecasts for what we expect for 2021. And they're pretty uncertain, so take them with a grain of salt. Their expectation is for um, Bristol Bay sockeye to be about 6% above. The, now, this is the 10-year um, <clears throat> average, the past 10 years. But for Kuskokwim Chinook, Yukon Chinook, and Yukon Chum Salmon, we're expecting below average runs in 2021. Now there's a little bit more information we have to, to go beyond just um, what we expect to come back in 2021. And that's thanks to surveys that we do in the Eastern Bering Sea. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Northern Bering Sea Surface Trawl Survey. Um, and that survey occurs really from Nunavik Island in the south all the way up to the Bering Strait. On this map, um, these black dots are showing the locations where um, there are survey stations. And NOAA started this survey almost 20 years ago. So it has a pretty um, robust history. And uh, we began working with NOAA over the past several years to transform what's really a lot of great ecological data into information that can inform management. And the primary product we get out of it, our forecast right now, we're focused on forecast for Chinook salmon to the Yukon River. Uh, these surveys occur in September. So, and, and most of the fish that we catch with this gear are really smaller pelagic fish. So herring, capelin, and juvenile salmon. And when I talk about juvenile salmon throughout this talk, these are fish that have left the river earlier this, that year and have just spent their first summer in the ocean. So most of the salmon we catch in the Northern Bering are Yukon River and Norton Sound stocks. Although in some of these warmer years, we have seen some more of those Southern Bering sea stocks, Cuscoquim and Bristol Bay moving into the North. And again, you know, one of the prime products that we get from this survey is uh, forecast tools for Yukon Chinook salmon. And so one of the unique things about these forecast tools are that we can get um, estimates up to three years into the future because these are fish that have just migrated out of the river. Um, they're gonna be spending another few years in the ocean before they return in, in future runs. And so what we do is we take the juvenile Chinook abundance information from the surveys. We take genetic uh, tissue sample data from samples that we collected on the surveys. And then we look at the maturity schedules of fish that return to the river so that we can feed all that information into how many fish we expect to come back in all of the future runs. So far, it's been a pretty reliable tool for uh, planning. Uh, which is particularly important on the Yukon because we have um, some pretty large subsistence needs on the Yukon for salmon. So these figures, the top figure you're seeing here is showing Canadian origin Yukon Chinook abundance. 
The bottom figure is showing total Yukon uh, Chinook abundance. The gray bars are, are the observed run sizes. So that's what came back to the river. And the black dotted line with the air bars are the, um, the forecasted abundance based on this juvenile forecast tool. And so you can see for the most part, they overlap pretty well. They've done a pretty good job. And um, over the next couple of years, unfortunately, based on what we've seen in the juvenile abundance, we expect um, pretty poor run size for the next two years. Now we can't go the third year out, unfortunately, because we weren't able to run a survey in 2020 because of COVID. But we are planning a survey in 2021. So um, we're also planning on, on expanding, using this tool to expand to try to forecast some additional stocks. So we're looking at developing a Yukon fall chum forecast, as well as a pink salmon forecast for uh, northern bearing stocks for Yukon and, and Norton Sound. So we also are this year will be conducting a survey in the southern Bering Sea. So this is really at this point it's a feasibility survey. We just started uh, sampling in the southern Bering in 2018 and 2019 and we're going again in 2021. Uh, again, this occurs in August and September, so we're getting primarily those juvenile salmon, the fish that have just um, spent their first summer at sea. And these, uh, this sampling is really targeting Kuskokwim and Bristol Bay salmon stocks. And, and our objective right now is just to get an idea of the timing of when these fish are entering trawlable habitats, what we call trawlable habitats. So that's really 18 meters or deeper um, because the, the, unlike in the Northern Bering Sea, there are these big bays for, for Kuskokwim Bay and, and Bristol Bay where the salmon can, um, can rear for a period of time before they enter deeper water. And so we're trying to find that sweet spot when they're um, moving out of the bays and entering trawlable habitat but before they really disperse um, in, in the much deeper waters. And so we're trying to get an idea of timing. One of the things we're adding this year is um, an environmental DNA or eDNA sampling. So we're, in addition to the trawl information, the surface trawl information on uh, abundance of fish that we catch, we're using, we're testing out eDNA to see how that tool will help in terms of detecting presence and absence of these different species. So I mentioned that this uh, short talk was going to uh, also talk about some of the key takeaways we've gained from the past you know, 20 years of doing some of this research in the Bering Sea. And one of the key things that we've learned is that the number of adults that return in future years seems to be determined by the end of their first summer at sea. So when we see more juvenile salmon in the ocean, we end up seeing more of those fish from those same cohorts of, of fish uh, return in future years. So that seems to be true for Chinook salmon and the Yukon from our Bering Sea data, our Northern Bering Sea data. Also for pink salmon, where we've got indications that that's true from the Northern Bering Sea data. And then there's an, another project in Southeast Alaska uh, that we use to forecast pink salmon as well. So, so that's true there too. And, and the more we look across um, similar kinds of projects across the Pacific, we're seeing more and more evidence that, that there's a pretty strong pattern that er, the very early life of these fish is really important for dictating what comes in the um, afterwards in terms of the numbers, the abundance of salmon that return to the rivers in the future. And the other uh, takeaway that I, we wanted to share was that the, the Bering Sea is, is changing, obviously, and those changes affect salmon. So we're seeing more southern stocks moving north from the southern Bering and even stocks that 
don't typically spend a lot of time in the Bering Sea are moving up into the Southern Bering. So they're all kind of shifting upwards a little bit. We're seeing different of food available for juvenile salmon. So for Chinook salmon, juvenile Chinook in Northern Bering, uh, you know, typically in cooler weather years, they eat a lot of capelin. Um, but in these warm years, those capelin just aren't available and we're seeing more sand lands in the diets and, and other food sources. In really warm years, like we saw in 2019, we're seeing uh, a lot more empty stomachs in, in the juvenile salmon. So um, that's probably to do with a higher metabolism based on the water temperatures. And, um, but, but that's a little bit concerning. Um, obviously in the Bering Sea, the loss of sea ice and how that structures the whole um, ecology of the Bering Sea is a, is a concern. But the other thing I wanted to point out is even um, things that are happening in the Gulf of Alaska, North Pacific Ocean, in terms of warming, brain heat waves, the blob, that can also affect Bering Sea salmon. The Chin Western Alaska Chinook tend to stay in the Bering Sea throughout their marine life, but all the other salmon species migrate through the Bering Sea and at least over winter in, in the North Pacific and um, Gulf of Alaska. So, so warming that is occurring in other parts of the ocean are also affecting Bering Sea salmon. And then finally, we've seen in these warmer years, these recent warmer years, um, more large juveniles. And when that happens, there tends to be more what we call jacks. So these are particularly young uh, Chinook salmon that are age three and four return to the rivers from those juvenile cohorts. So we're seeing changes to the age and the size compositions of the runs that appears to be related to um, the, the growth rates of these salmon in their very early life. And so altogether, this just is to point out that, you know, the Bering Sea is changing the, and the fate of these salmon is, is pretty closely linked to all those changes that we're seeing in the Bering Sea. And with that, I just wanna thank you. I have my email address up here. I also just wanted to mention that uh, if people are interested, we do have a Facebook page called ADF&G, the Undersea World of Salmon and Sharks. And we try to share updates on all of the research that I just talked about on that Facebook page as well. So I think Yvette is next. I can figure out how to stop sharing. Should be right at the top. Okay, you bet it's all you. And I think you're oh, I think you're still muted as well. Do you get that it? work? Yeah. yeah. Get back to the um, screen. I don't know what's going on. But can you hear me and can you see the title slide? Yes, looks perfect. Okay, I'm not sure I turned my camera on, did I, before I lost, or can you see me? Uh, nope, your camera's not on. I can't, it won't let me back to the Zoom page. Oh, here we go. Did that work? Yes, that works. Okay. I'm back into presentation. There you go, perfect. <laughs> All right, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I only have one screen while I'm traveling here. Um, well, uh, my name's Yvette Sidden, um, and I'm just going to, I'll try to make up a little time so we leave time for questions here. I'm gonna give a quick update on the Bering Sea surveys that NOAA is running this year in um, the Bering, and, and I have one slide on a, a Southern Chukchi survey happening as well. Um, and before I get into those survey updates, I think it's probably worth mentioning, you know, it, Noah is really quite grateful to be able to be back in the field this year, um, but also 
really um, thoughtfully to, to sort of keep the health and safety of the communities that we interact with at, at the forefront. So um, I'm gonna present the surveys that we have coming up. Um, each slide will have a point of contact at the bottom uh, and an email if folks have additional questions for the kinds of information that was collected. So um, I'll go chronologically through the surveys. The first uh, are the aerial surveys for seals and polar bears that, is, um, that took place, just ended this week uh, in the Beaufort Sea. This had been going on uh, since mid-April. And this survey is looking at uh, both ringed and bearded seals uh, through the Marine Mammal Lab. And then in collaboration with US Fish and Wildlife Service and the USGS, also doing um, concurrent counts of polar bears. So looking at the predator and looking at the prey in the system. And these surveys really support planning and decision-making for both um, uh, of these stocks that are important to the agencies as well as the communities that rely on them as a traditional resource. The next slide I'll cover here is the eco foci spring mooring and hydrographic survey. Um, this one took place during the month of May. Uh, this survey looks at how varying biological and physical factors influence the ecosystem. So the um, survey track line is there, the blue and yellow denote stations where um, either just a CTD or a CDD and a bongo cast are made. And the, the whole survey really has four objectives. The first is to service some of the moorings uh, that collect water information, sea ice properties. Also on those moorings, there are um, units to detect marine mammals and human activities. That's the first objective. The second is to sample the water column for zooplankton, juvenile fish, and also any bottom dwelling organisms. The third is they deploy drifters to look at uh, currents happening over the shelf there. And then the fourth is deploy buoys that um, can monitor marine mammal presence in real time over the Bering Sea. The next survey really spans the, the Gulf and Aleutians and Bering. This is our long line survey. It occurs in the Gulf of Alaska every year. And then the pink stations there shown along the shelf break in the Bering happen in odd years. So they're happening this year and the Aleutian Islands are sampled in even years. Um, and this survey produces catch rates, species composition, length and age data for some species shown here in the icons on the right, sablefish, Pacific cod, several different rockfish, rockfish species, short spine thorny head, uh, and Greenland turbot, among others, as well as uh, sharks and grenadiers. This survey, for folks that aren't familiar with it, operates in a cost recovery mode. So the proceeds from the catch collected during the survey uh, are able to offset the cost of the um, charter, the chartered vessel that conducts the survey. The next survey folks are probably uh, most familiar with, this is the Eastern Bering Sea Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. This kicked off on May 25th and the there are two boats operating in tandem to complete the grid there over the southern shelf. And it will, with those two boats, it will continue through um, around August 4th, they're estimating. Uh, this survey monitors the groundfish and crab uh, shellfish, including walleye pollock, Pacific cod, several flatfish species. So um, yellow fin sole, northern rock sole, um, also turbot there and the crab stocks, um, the king crab, snow crab, tanner crab are shown there. This survey um, produces much of the biomass estimates that feed the stock assessments, um, which NOAA will then present through the council through the fisheries management process um, in the fall. The um, sort of extension or the northern portion of the Bering Sea Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey will also be happening this year. This survey has happened in three previous years. Um, and so we're fortunate to be able to, to do that sampling this year, as Katie mentioned, with those shifting distributions of fish stocks into the Northern Bering Sea. So I've highlighted, you know, folks, the Pacific cod and snow crab, 
um, with those sort of demonstrated shifts north, those are the kinds of things this survey is looking for. So this survey will kick off about August 2nd when those boats or whenever the boats complete the, the southern survey and run through um, towards the end of August to complete the grid shown here. So the next slide is just a um, animation of the bottom temperatures that are collected by these two vessels as the survey got underway. So we're a couple weeks into the first survey. They, the two vessels are denoted the A and the V are the two different vessels there. As each plot updates, it's just showing you which stations are planned for the vessels for the next day and then filling in what the observed bottom temperatures are. At the end, these are showing uh, real time bottom temperatures. Uh, at the completion of the survey, these will be sort of date corrected so that uh, although the survey takes three months to complete, there'll be a relative map of what the bottom temperatures were. And the link there on the right is um, one of the NOAA Fisheries web pages, and you can log on. This uh, GIF as well as the daily plot are being updated um, daily from the survey as it, as it works its way over the shelf. Um, so this is just the static most recent plot as of uh, June 20th, showing the stations planned for June 21st yesterday. So you can start to see what the bottom temperatures are looking like over the shelf. So far, the bottom temperatures have not reached the formal definition of the cold pool, which is less than two degrees C, but have gotten very close. And the coldest temperatures encountered so far uh, in the central basin of Bristol Bay reached uh, 2.2 degrees. The next three weeks should be pretty telling in terms of what the footprint or the cold pool, the trace of where sea ice was last winter um, as the vessels work to complete the stations around St. Matthew's Island. So we'll see what that looks like as the survey works its way up there. The next plot, uh, which was provided by Lyle Britt this is looking at anomalies of their bottom temp of their survey bottom temperatures. So, so far we only have anomalies over the southern shelf. That time series runs from 1987 through 2019. So, looking this anomaly plot is looking at this year's observed bottom temperatures relative to that time series of the um, the full time series of the survey. And so. Um, I just have some notes here from Lyle uh, passed on. So the bottom temperatures are cooler than what has been observed in recent years, including 2019. And of course, um, we were not able to conduct the survey in 2020. Uh, and particularly, he notes in the near shore water shallower than 50 meters depth. Um, this anomaly plot shows that the stations near Nunavak and east towards Togiak are cooler than the historical average. Uh, in addition to better overwinter ice conditions in the Eastern Bering Sea, this may also be due to cooler weather and consistent stormy weather conditions encountered during the survey so far, which Rick mentioned that um, storminess metric, uh, but Lyle passed on from the survey vessel. It even snowed one day while one of the vessels was sampling near Nunavak Island just in the last week. Um, the last survey I'll talk about is the one Katie mentioned, our Northern Bering Sea Surface Trawl and Ecosystem Survey. This is, as she mentioned, a cooperative uh, effort with Fishing Game and others to look at not only the salmon stocks, um, Chinook, and uh, but also some of the ecosystem components. So it, with a surface trawl, it also catches some um, species of juvenile, early stages of uh, fish like pollock, uh, and zooplankton so we can look at um, trends in food, the fish food distributions over time. The last two plots I'll show are um, produced by Jordan Watson. These are looking at sea surface temperatures and the marine heat wave status uh, over the some of our regions. And I'll flip sort of back and forth so you can see on this plot, I'm showing the Northern Bering Sea on the left hand panel there and the southeastern Bering Sea on the right. And I'll jump ahead just to so you can get a sense. We divide uh, the definition between northern and southeastern at 60 degrees north latitude. So going back here, the top panel shows sea surface temperature 
uh, over time and the the months are are pretty small to read there along the bottom but it basically starts january 1 on the left of the plot and runs continuous through as of uh, june 19th these are updated on the website uh, the purple line is the long-term mean the blue line is last year and then 2021 is plotted in black that's the current year the bottom panel is tracking the marine heat wave status. So heat waves are defined when the daily sea surface temperature exceeds the 90th percentile of normal for five consecutive days. So, and then uh, if it were to be in some years we have seen really warm, that heat wave intensity can increase uh, successively as the, as the waters are, are more and more warm. So if we look at 2021 in the northern Bering Sea, we came into 2021 in January. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but in January here in heat wave status in the northern Bering Sea. But it has since cooled to normal or average temperatures uh, and then warmed slightly above average, but not heat wave status uh, through May and June. And we have seen pretty significant jump here just in the last week in the northern Bering Sea. If we jump over to the southern or southeastern Bering Sea, uh, we have stayed consistently above average, but just really tiptoeing. You can barely see it in this plot, but through parts of May and June, sort of tiptoeing along that uh, heat wave threshold. And then again in the last week, really jumping up, maybe just touching into the heat wave status in the southeastern Bering Sea. The next plot I'll show, and I thought folks on this call might be interested, is to look at the Aleutian Islands. So I'll show the next plot, again, is broken by these three regions, the Western, Central, and Eastern Aleutian Islands. And the plot is uh, formatted similarly. So the top panel are the sea surface temperatures over the year, starting January 1, and the bottom plots are tracking that heat wave status in, across the three regions. And I'll just point out here, um, you know, in all three regions, the temperatures have been above average, but it's worth noting in both the Western and Central Aleutians uh, have been in heat wave status and continue to be in heat wave status uh, since June. And this last slide is just some of the links that I um, included in the slides and for folks if they're interested in um, following up on any of these the the top one are those uh, real-time updates of the bottom temperatures from the bottom trawl survey um, the second is a, a twitter update of the sea surface temperatures in the eastern bearing sea that gets updated bi-weekly but if you just can't wait uh, for that to get updated the next link there is for a shiny app you can go in and look at the most current sea surface temperature plots and marine heat wave status plots in that shiny app for any of our regions so we have the Bering Sea both north and south Aleutian Islands and the Gulf of Alaska and then the last two links are for some of our web stories that are updates on our surveys happening this summer and I'm going to uh, stop sharing so folks can ask questions of any of the presenters. Uh, and thank you for having us. Yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm going to let us go just a couple minutes over so folks have time to ask questions. Um, that was a lot to cover in an hour. And I, I appreciate all my presenters um, sticking on such a tight timeline. So I've given everyone the ability to unmute themselves. If you'd like, um, you can either type your question into the chat and I'll read them out loud like always, or if you wanted, you can unmute yourself and ask out loud. And also while I have everyone's attention, um, the last thing I just posted in the link is a survey that we conduct after every one of these webinars that pertains um, to this webinar and the Alaska Climate Webinar Series in general. And it's, um, it's just five simple questions. So if you would, uh, if you have a moment, we'd appreciate if you answer those questions. But for now, let it, let's hop to um, any questions for our presenters. So please go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask away. And there are some thanks coming in on the chat as well. Let me scroll back through to make sure I haven't missed any. Yes, if anyone has any questions, please unmute yourself. I know that was a lot to cover, so.
And then do also, um, if you wanted to check out the latest publication, you can go um, to the, uh, the Bearing Science, here, I'll put the link in the chat. You can go to their website and check it out. And you also can find it on uh, the webinar page for this particular webinar, which I will also put in the chat as well. So if you wanted to check out the latest publication, it is beautiful, so please do. Anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we'll let our presenters out of the hot seat. And let everyone get on with their Tuesday. Right. Well, without seeing any questions come in, please do. You can save the chat and you can check out all of those things that were shared. And the um, PDF of the presentation is also on the webinar page. So you can get all of this information there as well. Um, our next webinar is going to be July 13th, and it'll be a partnership with NASA's Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, or above. And it is going to be a presentation about using a model to predict historical PM 2.5 um, levels in Alaska. So if you're interested in, in wildfire, wildfire smoke, please do check that out. Um, the registration is on the ACAP website, www.acap.uaf.edu. We've been hosting webinars on topics relevant to climate change in Alaska since June of 2007. The archive of our past webinars is located on our website, as I said, acap.uaf.eu. If you would like to join our listserv or receive announcements of future webinars, have questions or feedback, or would like to suggest a topic for a future webinar, please contact me through the website or by phone at 907-474-7812 or by email at acap.uaf.edu. And thank you to our fantastic presenters today. And thank you all for joining us and have a great Tuesday and happy day after solstice, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Yeah, thanks everyone.